All right, you guys ready? What happened there? Are you guys ready? All right, that, that makes me feel better. Hey, listen, will you help me welcome everybody in Peru and everybody online? Put your hands together for them. Thank you for being a part of what we have going on here. Merry Christmas, everybody. And listen, I don't know about you, but I love Christmas. Anybody love Christmas? All right. I, you know, and I don't know about you, but guess what? I'm way ahead this year. Way ahead. If you've been around here very long at all, you know that I don't Christmas shop till Christmas Eve. But see, today I'm working. So I had to do it Friday, but be, be of good cheer. I got it done in about eight hours, praise God. I, I, I needed stocking stuffers, so guess what I did? This morning at 7 o'clock, Cracker Barrel is a great place to buy stocking stuffers. Come on, where are my men at? Come on. Uh, I'm, you know, and I know some of you are like, well, you should have planned better. No, 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 no. Oh, ye of little faith. So, let, let, let me explain. See, to me, the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. It takes no faith to plan 30 days out what you're buying for Christmas. If you're a man of faith, you wait. Because the Lord may speak. Okay, anyway, I'm done. All right, you guys ready for the message? That's what you're here for. Listen, last week we talked about, we're, we're titling this series, Just Simply Christmas, all right? It, it's just simple, keeping it simple, keeping it easy, and kind of moving in, the, in this path. And what I've done is, uh, first week I, I brought you the idea of seven words that I believe pertain to Christmas, all right? We talked about the words like blessed and favored and all those things, and we used it right from the Christmas story. Then last week I came back and I said, I believe there are miracles that around the idea of Christmas. Believe it or not, you're here today because of miracles. You believe that? Yeah. Jesus, Jesus coming to the earth was a miracle, y'all. It was a miracle. It was something that no one ever thought ever would happen. Even the prophets in the Old Testament struggled with the understanding of it. But we know now God did it, praise God. And we're here 2,000 years later celebrating the idea of Christmas. Last week I gave you three different miracles. Today I'm going to give you four more. But here's the first three. I said the miracle of God loving man. The fact that God loves man. I mean, that's amazing to me. God loves you. God loves you because you were made in his image and likeness. He loves you regardless of what you do. He loves you because he created you, all right? So there's number one. Number two, I gave you this, the miracle of God visiting man. That, that, that really is a powerful thing. God came to this earth. He came and lived among us. He lived here for 33 and a half years. It's recorded all throughout history, not just in Jewish literature, in Roman literature and other cultures. The reality of Jesus, the fact that he came to this earth. Then we have the third miracle I told you about was that God living in man. Now think about that. God didn't just come to, to this earth to die and rescue us, which he did do that. What he did is he came to live inside of us. So watch this, everybody. Everybody celebrating Christmas. And they believe that Jesus came to the earth and died for them. And yes, that's true. But guess what? He lives on the inside of us. He lives on the inside of me. He is alive and well on the inside of me. And can I tell you, that's the Christ of Christmas. The fact that he lives on the inside of me and on the inside of you. Now, if you're born again, he lives on the inside of you. Now, if you're not born again, stick around for the prayer. We'll get you born again and get God living on the inside of you. Can I get an amen on that? All right. So, so that's what we got. Those are the first three. Now, these last four I think are powerful. And, and I'm not going to give you specific Bible verses con, uh, pertaining to just Christmas because they're a little bit broader than that. But I believe they pertain in a very, very major way. So here they are. Number four. Check this one out. The miracle of God adopting man. Do you know that you're here celebrating Christmas because God wanted to adopt you. He wanted you as sons and daughters. That's what he wanted. He wanted you to have a family. That's what he wanted. And I want you to hear this, everybody. You were actually born, watch this, with a family, but with a broken family. You say, oh, no, Pastor Charlie, my mom and my dad, they were great. They were perfect. They were awesome. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Adam and Eve fell. And when they fell, they started having children. When they started having children, those children have a fallen nature on the inside of them. They are separated from God, in a sense, broken. And 
those broken people multiply. And what happens is, watch this, God wants to heal the brokenness of that home and of that family and of that person. Let me give you the opposite so you can contrast it with something. And here's, here's what John 14 says. I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. Now watch this. Jesus in that context is talking to the disciples. Now listen to it. He didn't say they didn't have a mom and a dad. He said, I won't leave you as orphans. They were orphans. Even though they had a mother and a father, they were orphans. You say, well, how is it that they're orphans, but yet they have a mom and a dad? Because they were missing out on the greatest father that they could ever have, which is God the Father. Are y'all picking up what I'm saying? See, because here's the truth. Each and every one of us, when we're born into this earth, we're born separated from God. And we're born with an orphan heart on the inside of us. And you say, well, what exactly is that? We're all born, in a sense, feeling disconnected from the family of God. And here's the truth. Some of us were born disconnected from that family of God, but we had great family, which made us feel apart. But that doesn't necessarily make you a part of the family of God. Then there are other, others of us who maybe were born, and we were born separated from God, and we didn't feel like we had a family either in the natural. Our mother and father maybe made us feel like we weren't valued or we weren't cared for. And because of that, you grow up with this orphan heart, this, this sense that you don't ever belong uh, in a place. And you, you don't really, you don't really, you're always on the outside looking in. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you just quick, and I'm not going to wear you out on this, but I just want you to understand what an orphan heart is because it's contrasted to an adopted heart. But an orphan heart, it does not feel like it has a home. Doesn't have a safe place. If they struggle with belonging, these are just some of the symptoms. Uh, they feel like they're an outsider, always looking in. They feel like they have no inheritance. They feel like they 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 don't have unconditional love. That the love that they experience is always based upon their behavior and this and that and the other, but not unconditional. It, it's a struggle. They struggle with who they are. And I'm not talking about personal identity. I'm talking about family identity. I'm talking about being a part of something that's bigger than yourself. They struggle with those things. They struggle with authority. They desire a home. They desire a safe place. They desire a place of warmth and acceptance and belonging. They desire that. And the truth of it is, everybody under the sound of my voice desires that. A place of warmth and acceptance and a place of unconditional love. And again, some of you experienced that in your home because you had great mothers and fathers. Some of you didn't experience that because you didn't have a mother and father that maybe gave you that. I know one of the one, one of the things that comes to my mind whenever I think of Christmas and all that is one of the most disappointing times of my life was my father, as far as Christmas goes, check this out. And again, I'm over this, so please, you know, I'm healed. It's all good, all right? I'm not bitter about it, but here's what happened. I was in the military. I was stationed in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. I don't know why anybody live in Indiana, but whatever, we're here. But I'm in Florida, and my, my mother and father, specifically my father, I had not ever done Christmas, Christmas with my father because he was in uh, prison and then got out of prison, so on and so forth. Long story short, fast forward. So building this relationship with my father, we, on Christmas Eve, we decided we would drive from, from Fort Walton Beach, going down I-10, all the way through Biloxi, all the way Mobile, all the way down there, all the way to Lake Charles, Louisiana. That's where we were headed. We got about three and a half hours into the trip, which puts us on the other side of Biloxi, Mississippi. And our car breaks down. It's Christmas Eve. It's midday, Christmas Eve. And I called my dad, and I knew everybody would be at my aunt's because he told me that's where they'd be. I called my, aunt, my aunt's house, and I talked to my dad, and I said, hey, Dad, we broke down. He goes, yeah, you guys are going to have to figure that out. And I go, what do you mean we're going to have to figure that out? He goes, man... We're not going to come get you. We're, we're, we're all partying and having fun, and we're not going to spend three hours coming to get you. And I thought, I hung up the phone. I literally hung up the phone. I called a buddy of mine in the military. Mike Orso is his name. Still one of my friends to this day. He was a Sicilian Italian from Brooklyn. He <laughs> fixed your car. All right? Called him up. And this is how it is in the military. Called him up. I'm like, Mike, we're broke down on the other side of Biloxi. He goes, I'll be there in a little bit. Sure enough, he boogied down with us, 
picked us up on Christmas Eve, came back, and then, boom, went and towed the car. Can I tell you, from that point on, I never went and spent a Christmas Eve. I never spent a Christmas Eve with my family. You know what I mean? And, and not, not, not for any other, not out of bitterness or anything like that, but I thought, oh, my goodness. Here I am, broke down on the side of the road. It's Christmas Eve, and you guys can't come get us? Come on, are y'all picking up what I'm... So what that did is that empowered that orphan heart on the inside of me. And it made me feel like I didn't have a place. I didn't have a place to belong. That's why whenever I got on fire for God, this means so much to me. It means so much to me to be in a place where I know people and people love me. and People do anything for me and I would do anything for them. It makes you feel like you're a part of something. This is what the house of God is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place where you fit and you belong. And you're not an orphan, but you belong in the family of God. And it means so much. Like I've had people in, in years past, you know, and, and whatever, and they'll say, Pastor Charlie, you ever, you know, take another job or take a bigger church or you this or you that and you this and you that? And I go, no, no way, no way, no how. I have no interest. Don't even bother me with all that stuff. They're like, why not? You could this, you could that. I have no interest. Why? Because this is where I belong. This is where my family is. Whether you like it or not, we, this is my peeps. <laughs> all right? This is my peeps, man. You know? And... Because I love it. I love it. it. It means something to me. Because I've been adopted and I've been accepted. And because of that, I find warmth and safety there. And let me just tell you, if you're looking for that in life, the best place to find it is in the house of God. It's in the house of God. And Christmas really is all about family. And we talk about it as family. But can I tell you, you can open Christmas presents, but if you don't have the Christ in Christmas... You don't experience that adoption, and you don't experience what Christmas is really all about. That's God accepting you as a son and daughter of God. Can I get a big amen, praise God? I believe that with all my heart. Listen to this. Whenever it comes to this, you know, we talk about these are the things that an orphan heart has, but I want to tell you, there's a remedy to that, and the remedy is Jesus, the Christ in Christmas. Listen to this. You and I have an inheritance. So you may feel like you have no inheritance, but the Bible says something different. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. You know, I grew up not feeling like I had anything, but I'm telling you, I have everything now. Everything pertaining to life and godliness, I have because I understand the Christ and Christmas and what it's all about. Here's another one I was thinking about. Check this out. You are cared for. You are cared for. There's never a day that you're going to live on this planet as a child of God, a part of the family of God that you're not cared for. God cares about you. I love what the Bible says about this. Matthew 6, 31, it says these words. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? I'm glad that one's there. Come on, help me out. All right, okay. Now watch this, though. Watch this. There's something powerful I want to show you. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Now, these are your needs. Gentiles seek their needs to be met. Now watch what it says. Listen to it. Gentiles seek people without God, people with an orphan heart. They just want their needs to be met. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And I've heard people say, well, Pastor Charlie, you know, I just, I just count on God to meet my needs. I go, well, okay. But even the Gentiles think that. But here's the truth. This Christmas, you're not going to get your kids in the living room and go, okay, guys, here's what we, we've decided. We're only going to buy you underwear, toothpaste, and socks. Why? Those are your needs. Now, what's wrong with that? That's silly. Nobody does that. You, you care about what they... Oh, come on. Where are you at? It's the wants that you want to fulfill. Let, 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 me, let me translate it into my world. I'm so excited this Christmas. My grandson is two years old. Last year, he didn't really get it. It's not because he's slow. He's one. Okay? I don't know where you were going, but I was cutting you off before you got there. All right? But listen to this. He's two, and he understands it. He understands rip, rip the gifts. But can I tell you how today and tomorrow is going to go down? I can tell you how it's going to go down. He's going to get a box. He's going to rip into it. And as soon as he sees clothes, doesn't matter. Why? That's a need. I don't even worry about my needs. I don't care about my needs. 
Christmas is all about to him what I, what I want. I want Peppa the pig, praise God. That's what I want. I want, get, show me some Peppa and we can have some time here. But I do not care about underwear or diapers in his case. But you get what I'm saying, all right? But, but here's my point. You ready? Listen to my heart. Your father in heaven, he doesn't just meet your needs. The Bible says he'll meet your needs. He cares about your wants. As a son and daughter, he cares about your wants. It's okay to say, God, I want this. God, I want that. See, I, I've had to learn to be comfortable with that. Because I, like you, grew up in the idea that, well, it's only about your needs. But you know what? No father only meets the needs of his children. Come on, talk to me. They meet their wants too, praise God. And now, there are limits to the wanting. If you've got 10 kids, you don't need a Corvette unless you've got a real good job. But, <laughs> all right. But, but the reality is, the reality is he cares about, why? Because he's a father. You've been adopted. Listen to this. Watch this. You are secure. The Bible says it, for I know the thoughts I have to you, for you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope, praise God. How about this one? You are loved. I've talked to you about that one already. How about this one right here? You have an identity. I know with me, I struggled. I struggled with identity, my family identity, who I was, and all that stuff. Now I have no problems with my identity. Because I know who God made me, and I know what God made me, and I'm adopted in the family. I'm a part of a family that's bigger than my family. Y'all getting what I'm saying? And because of that, let me just tell you one of the keys in parenting. You ready? Listen, parents. When family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. When you allow your kids to grow up in a home where we're Rileys, and this is how we function. This, we're Rileys, and this is how we act. And this is how we don't act. We're Rileys. This is how we function. And when you enforce that over and over and over a period of time, eventually it gets ingrained. It's slow, but it gets there, all right? And it gets ingrained to where your kids understand that to be a part of this family, there's a conduct that, that represents it, and there's a way to behave that represents it. And it's a way of honoring not only your family, but God. Are y'all picking up what I'm saying? And it's important that we understand that. It's, so, so it says this, For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. That, voice is, that verse is also echoed in Galatians, where it says this, And because you are sons, everybody say sons. Amen. Now that word sons there is sons and daughters, okay? It's kind of like the word Adam. The word Adam actually represents humanity, okay? I know we oftentimes think to Adam and Eve. Yeah, but there are times in the Bible where the term Adam is used, where it's talking about Adam and Eve, okay? This is the same. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Watch this. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a what? But a son. Do you see yourself as a son and daughter of God? Do you see yourself? I am a son and daughter of, er, well, I'm a son of God. <laughs> Got to watch how you say that one. <laughs> I, am, I am a son of God, all right? Now watch this, everybody. People say, well, Pastor Charlie, you're a servant. No, no. No, no, I'm not a servant. A servant in the house, according to what Jesus taught, a servant in the house has no inheritance. I'm a, watch this, I'm a son who serves. I'm a son who serves. But I'm not a servant. I'm a son. Servants don't have an inheritance. They aren't heirs. Right? Sons are heirs. I'm an heir. I'm the brother of Jesus. So are you, brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are sons and daughters of God, the Father. Y'all picking it up? I think that's important. He says this, and if son, and then an heir of God through Christ. That's exactly what I was just saying. Listen, Ephesians says it this way, and we did a whole series on it, so I'm not going to wear you out on it. But here's what it said. Blessed be the God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Notice the tense, past tense. Has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In Christ, just as he chose us. Come on, you're a chosen people. He chose you. He chose us in Christ, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Watch this. Having predestined us to adoption. He predicted and preplanned 
everything for us to be adopted as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure for his will, to the praise of his glory of his gr and of his grace, by which he made us, what, what, what's it say? Accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Christmas is all about God making a way for us to be accepted. There's no reason you should ever feel rejected. No reason. Why? You're accepted in the beloved. You're accepted. You're accepted. You ever been rejected before? That doesn't feel good. You ever been accepted though? Man, that means everything, praise God. You're accepted. And you are I, we are accepted. There's no reason. So this Christmas, we have to remember, God has accepted us. He sent Jesus to be born of a virgin so that he could adopt me and adopt you. We are adopted. Amen? Amen. I believe that with all my heart. Here's the, here's the fifth miracle. Everybody say number five. <laughs> number five. Here it is. The miracle of God as a suffering Savior. That's a powerful one. Okay? Now, we, we, we understand Christmas, Jesus being born in a, in a manger. But do you understand that? He was born in a manger as a baby, but yet before he got to the manger, he knew he would suffer. Okay, let me give you the verse. And then I want to correct something I said in the U.S. for it series, all right? So here it is. Look at this, Revelation 13, 8, watch this. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Talking about the Antichrist in the context. Whose names have not been written in the book of life. Now watch this, this is a side note. This is free, okay? Whose names are not written in the book of life. You remember in the You Asked For It series, I said, I believe everyone's name is written in the book of life, and some names are blotted out. Okay, now, here's the deal with the Bible. You can either believe the Bible, or you can believe Charlie. Here's what I would believe. The Bible. When I read that last night, I was like, how come I've never seen that before? I missed it. So here's the truth. You ready? It obviously says, this is not the U.S. Fort Series, so I'm not going there. But here it is. Whose names have not been written in the book of life? So apparently there aren't names written in the book of life. I stand corrected. All right, I'm done. I'm moving on. It says, life of the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the... So get this, everybody. Long before Jesus ever came in a manger, he worked it out with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, worked it out that Jesus would come and he would suffer and die for you and I. It was already pre-planned. God knew that man would fall. God knew before there was ever a star, before there was ever an earth, God predestined, already made a way for you and I to be accepted and adopted. And he decided to come, watch this, as a suffering savior. Now you say, well, of course that's the way he would come. But let me just ask you a question. Is that the way you would come? Y'all ain't picking it up. <laughs> you create this earth, it's perfect. You create everything in it, perfect. You create it because you got these little people called humans that you love. They're the, they're the, they're the apex of your creative power called humanity. And you tell them, here's the deal. I've created all this for you to enjoy. It's all yours. You can have everything you want. Every need is met. The gold is yours. The silver is yours. The trees are yours. The, the, the sky is yours. You have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth. Everything is yours. It's all yours. All I'm asking is don't touch the tree. Just don't touch the tree. Just don't touch the tree. You touch the tree, bad things happen. What's up? You touch the tree, it don't go well. You all picking up what I'm putting down? You touch the tree, the neighborhood goes bad. All right? And guess what they did? They touched the tree. So what does God do? I'm going to send my son. But you know what? Before that, I'm going to send prophets. I'm going to send different people into the earth to tell you about how to be redeemed and how to be saved and how to honor me. So they send these people. And what do people do to these people that come and speak on God's behalf? They persecute them. They kill them. They hang them. They stone them. You always wonder why in the Old Testament prophets always lived out by themselves? It's because everybody hated them. Because every time they showed up, they said what God said, and then the people were mad at them. Don't even get me started. Okay? But they did. 
So what does God do? 4,000 years after the fall, he comes to the earth as a suffering savior in a manger. My question is, is that how you would show up? My, you don't spit into the wind, you don't pull on Superman's cape, and you don't mess around with Jim. Come on, you might know the song. Where yo come? Some of you need help. But anyway, here's the truth. You ready? That's not how I would have showed up. I would have showed up. For, I would have showed up ticked. I would have showed up mad. I'd have been like, hey, listen, you guys jacked this up real good. You guys jacked this up real good. No, I ain't suffering. No, I'm not. I, I'm slapping you. I'm slapping you. I'm slapping you. Anybody else that does anything stupid, we're slapping. And I tell you what, I'm going to fix this now. I'm going to go and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And I'm going to resurrect myself. But if you guys jack this up again, it's over. I'm done. My patience is ran out. You made your bet. You lay in it. What's wrong with you? You got to sweep around your porch. I'm not sweeping around your porch. It's your house. You take care of your place, all right? I'm done taking care of your place. You fix your problems. I'm not fixing your problems. They're your problems. I didn't create the problem. I told you how to stay away from the problem. But no, you had a better idea. You go jacking with the tree. I told you to stay away from the tree. But you touch the tree. What is your problem? Y'all getting what I'm saying? <laughs> That's how I would have showed up. Anybody know what it's like living at my house? <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, here, but, but, but the truth of the matter is, I'm amazed that Jesus didn't show up that way. I'm just being honest, because that's how I would have showed up. I would have showed up mad. Jesus, here I am. I'm willing to forgive. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to be patient. I'm willing to endure everything. Matter of fact, I'm willing to be persecuted more than any prophet, any man that had ever lived, according to the Bible. And he did. Isaiah tells us about it. Isaiah 53, it says this. Now, I've trained, as, as you look at this, everybody, these quotes are the uh, Hebrew word translated. So you have it as we read it. So here it is. He was despised, talking about Jesus. This is not how I would have showed up, y'all. Aren't you glad I'm not God? <laughs> All right, anyway, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, pains, and acquainted with grief, sicknesses, he, and, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and he was, uh, and, uh, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne or carried our griefs. He did it for us. Sicknesses, and he carried our sorrows, our pains. And yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Look at this next part. But he was wounded for or pierced through for our transgressions. He was bruised, crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, we deserved all this, was upon him. All right? It says, and by his stripes, his bruises and wounds, we are what? Healed. Now watch this last part. And all like sheep have gone astray. In other words, Jesus knew it. He knew we would all go astray. We all got our issues. He says, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Everything that we deserved, he got. He freed us from that. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not the way I would have showed up. But Jesus showed up. The miracle of Christmas is that God sent his son knowing, knowing he was going to suffer and die for people who didn't deserve it. Who didn't deserve it. Have you ever given a gift to someone who doesn't deserve it? You're more like Jesus. At that, some of you are like, oh no, I got to go shopping. No, I'm not trying to get you under conviction or condemnation. I'm just trying to say, you have to understand what God was doing. He was redeeming us. Now, according to the Bible, and I believe this with all my heart, Isaiah 53 tells us that we can be healed. Whether it's spirit, whether it's soul, whether it's body, we can be healed. And I believe with all my heart, we should believe for healing, okay? Now, I know there are people who say, well, Pastor Charlie, I just don't believe we can be healed on this side of heaven. Okay, let's concede. I don't agree with that, by the way. I believe we should and we, we can be healed on this side of heaven. But let's just say in heaven we're healed. Okay, first of all, here's, here's what I will tell you. You ready? The older, somebody's choo-choo's <laughs> going off. Sometimes I'm up here and I'm like, does anybody hear a train? <laughs> Did you guys? She's chugging. <laughs> those online and those in Peru, they're like, I didn't hear nothing. I know. We heard it though. 
Was you guys here? The, I think it was the last service uh, several several months ago, maybe within the last year. I'm up here preaching, and there's a phone going off. Anybody hear about this? I'm up here preaching, and the phone keeps going off. And I'm like, oh, my word. And I'm, I'm doing everything I can to ignore it. I'm just preaching, preach, preach. And I keep moving around thinking, okay, it's stronger over there. Then so I'll go over here. And, I, and I'm preaching, right? And, but it never stops. And then it stopped. I was like, oh, praise God. Somebody answered their phone. You know? And I keep, and so I preach on this like five, ten minutes later. It starts going off again. And I'm like, what is the deal? Will somebody answer their phone? Finally, I'm like, okay, does anybody hear that? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, where is it coming from? It was under the stage. Somebody dropped their phone under the stage. And, the, and they uh, up at the New Here Star here, they were calling it. <laughs> and I'm up here preaching, and I'm like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, somebody stop the phone. Somebody stop the phone. And Jesus loves you. So stop the phone. <laughs> the things you run into doing this. All right. Anyway. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Jesus paid for our suffering. Now that the train's passed. All right, praise God. All right. How many of you believe we can be, believe God for healing today? That's a miracle, guys. That's a miracle in my opinion. Everybody say number six. Here's number six. The miracle of God's victory over the enemy. And again, we think of Christmas as being just, you know, Jesus in a manger. But can I tell you, Jesus came to defeat the adversary. Now, if you don't believe me, listen to this, everybody. What, was, what happened as soon as Herod, as soon as Herod, not a godly man, what did Herod do as soon as he found out Jesus was coming to the earth? He started killing the babies, didn't he? Why did he do that? Because Satan knew, Satan was inspired, inspiring Herod to kill the children because he was trying, Satan was trying to stop the Savior from being born. He was trying to nullify the word of God. He was trying to make sure that Jesus never got to the earth. But you and I know what happened. They went to Egypt. They took Mary, Joseph, and Jesus to Egypt, protected him until Herod died, then brought him back. Come on, amen? amen. Why? Because the enemy knew as soon as Jesus put his foot on this planet, his, his time was limited. He was about to be defeated, praise God. And this is why when the angel showed up, whenever Mary was pregnant, you know, in the shepherds, and he said, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. God knew that, or I'm sorry, Satan knew that God was about to change the entire plan. Look at this. I love this. First John, it says this. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of who? Jesus came to destroy the adversary and to destroy what the enemy was trying to do over our lives. Now listen to this, everybody. This is Ephesians, and again, we did a series, or Colossians. We, did, uh, we haven't done a series on it, but I'll, I'll, well, praise God. It says, and you, now I'm distracted, and you being dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you of all your trespasses. Look at this. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that were against us, which was contrary to us, and he, met, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed all principalities and powers, and made public spectacle of them in it, triumphing over them in it, so let no one judge you. Now, here's the bottom line of what I'm trying to say. We have to understand that Christmas is a reminder to the adversary that our Christ is king. Our Christ is for 4,000 years was prophesied. He was coming to this earth. He was coming. He was coming. He was coming. And the devil and everything he tried to do, he tried to make sure that Jesus never came. But let me just assure you of this. Jesus did come 2,000 years ago. And we're here celebrating the fact that he made it to this earth. So we celebrate it. And what I think is cool about it is, get this, cultures all over the world to, today, tomorrow, this Christmas season, they're celebrating Christmas. All right? Christ mass. Even people that don't believe in God are reminding the devil that Jesus made it. Jesus made it. He made it, and we're celebrating it. And we remind him every year that Jesus made it, praise God. That's how I see it. All right? You say, well, what could be better than that? Well, I got one more for you. 
one more miracle, which to me, it might be the greatest miracle. I mean, these, the, the, the six so far are great. But this seventh one, man, this is awesome. Here it is. You ready? You probably never heard it this way, but here it is. The miracle of God's second Christmas. Do you know there's a Christmas coming pretty soon? Well, Christmas is called the season of Advent. All right? Jesus coming to the earth is the first Advent, the first arrival of Jesus. If there's a first, there's a second coming, praise God. There is a second coming. You want to talk about the greatest Christmas ever, we have yet to experience it. There is a day coming where the sky is going to split. Jesus is going to return to this earth. And he is going to set up his rule and his reign over this entire earth. And he's going to rule from Jerusalem, praise God. That's the big Christmas that's coming. That's the Christmas that's coming. So I did just a little bit of quick studying on the, comp, uh, the compare and contrast. Let's talk about the difference between the first Advent, the first Christmas, and the second Advent, the second Christmas, and what it looks like. First of all, I just want you to understand here it is. This is what it's talking about. And behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him. And even they who pierced him, and all of the tribes of the earth, they will mourn because of him. That's right. Jesus is going to return. That's going to be the greatest Christmas ever of humanity. What does it look like? Well, let me give you some contrast. Christ shed his blood on the first time he came. The first advent he lived for 33 and a half years and then poured out his blood as a drink offering to the, to the Lord. In light of that, the second time, God's enemies shed their blood. Jesus shed his once forever and never more shall he shed it ever again. Here's the second one. Jesus was rejected by the Jews, but when he returns the second time, the second Christmas, he's going to be received by the Jews. Now here's what's wild. The Gentiles accepted Jesus the first time, but according to the Bible, the Gentile nations around Israel reject Jesus on his second return, on his second return, and he judges them. In the first advent, first time Jesus came, he set up a spiritual kingdom, and he said, you can't see it, but it's coming. Can I tell you, the second time he comes, when Jesus splits the sky, it is a physical, real kingdom that you're going to see visible on this planet. He's going to make this place his habitation and his home for eternity until the new heaven and new earth. When he came the first time, he had a crown of thorns placed on his head. But when he comes the second time, he will receive many crowns that we lay at his feet. On the first round, he was king of the Jews and he was crucified. <laughs> In the second advent, he's king of kings and lord of lords and he rules over the earth. He rules it, praise God. And of his kingdom... And of his government, the Bible says, there shall be no end. Don't put your faith in a bunch of politics. Jesus is going to set up his government over the earth, praise God. He's going to rule and reign over the earth. Amen? Amen. Listen to this. He came to save sinners the first time, second time. He's coming to judge all sinners, the living and the dead, the Bible says. How about this? The devil was bound. The devil bound Jesus whenever he first came, hung him on a cross and made a mockery of him. <laughs> Second coming, and not so. Guess what? Satan is bound for a thousand years, praise God. It's the enemy who gets bound, not Jesus. Jesus looses his power over the earth, and the enemy is now defeated over the earth, praise God. How about this one? Jesus is the Lamb of God the first time he came. But can I tell you, the second time he comes, he's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and the whole earth is going to hear his roar. He's going to set up his kingdom forever, praise God. Listen to this. The first time he came, he came to die. Absolutely. The second time, he's coming to defeat death, hell, and the grave forever, praise God. It will no longer have dominion over the earth. Here's the last slide I want to show you as far as this goes. Christ rides on a donkey the first time. Second time he returns, he's riding on a white horse, praise God. He's going to come through the sky, and he's going to come with all the saints of God. So whether you're here on the earth or whether you're in heaven, you're going to be returning with him, praise God. And he's going to rule and reign over the earth. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Me, I don't know about you, but I'm a little funny with the horse thing because I've rode a few horses and they, they seem kind of, I've asked the Lord for a tea bucket. 
a roadster, praise God. But anyway, all right, we'll work that out later. Listen, here's the truth. You ready? The first time Jesus came, he came as a servant. Second time he comes, he's coming as king. How about this? Jesus lies in a manger. He lies in a manger because he's the lamb of God. He's born in a town of Bethlehem because Bethlehem means house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life who comes. Anyone who partakes of him can receive the life of God. But can I tell you, the second time he comes, Jesus doesn't lay in a manger. He sits on a throne, and he rules and reigns over the earth. And all of the earth will obey him. All of the earth will understand who he is, what he is, and what he is doing on this planet. The only question I, I have for you is, do you look forward to the second Christmas that's to come, praise God? That's what I look forward to. There is a Christmas coming that's going to be awesome, praise God. And we're going to be there, praise God. Let me say that. If you are under the sound of my voice, you're going to be there. We're going to drag you if not. The only question is, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's, that's what it takes to be there. Here are the seven miracles on one slide so you understand it. And it, if you don't know Christ, we're going to give you an opportunity. But here it is. First miracle, God-loving man. Do you know God loves you? He loves you, man. He loves you. No matter what you've done, what you've been through, he loves you. Here's the truth. God visits man. God came as Emmanuel, God with us. Here's the third. God living in man. That God would live in you. What a privilege, huh? What a privilege. That God would adopt you. You're accepted. You're in the family. You all right? How about this? That God would suffer for you. And then give you victory over the adversary. Not that he needed it. You needed it. And then ultimately, 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 He's coming again. He's coming again for you and I. And he's going to split the sky. And whether we're, if we go by way of the grave and we're in heaven when he comes back, or whether we're here on the earth, it makes no difference to me. All that matters is I want to be there. And here's the truth. As a pastor, I want you to be there. As a Christian, as a family, I want you to be there. So if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, why don't you pray this prayer? Pray it with all of your heart. And I believe with all my heart, you'll be on your way to heaven. Now you say, Pastor, I'm not interested. Okay, that's fine. Just think about what I've given you today, all right? Now, those of you that are saved and born again, will you pray this out loud with me? Pray it out loud with all your heart. Those of you that maybe you've wanted to be saved or you don't know where you stand in light of eternity, I want you to pray it. And when you pray it, pray it with all your heart, and I believe with all my heart. It's not the perfect prayer that saves you. It's a right heart towards God that saves you. So... I would love for you to pray this prayer with me, okay? So if you don't mind, if you'd bow your heads, if everybody would pray this, say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe with all my heart you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again. I believe in the resurrected Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for Christmas and sending your son just for me in Jesus name come on everybody says amen, amen. would you give the Lord a big clap praise God